So welcome. I'd like to again say thank you. Thank you all for coming today to our first annual SNS Industry Day. Um, we look forward to doing this every year, having a recurring event. We hope that you do learn something today, that we provide you some knowledge and background on what we do, who we are, and what we kind of struggle with, as well as what we could procure you know, into the next fiscal year and beyond. So again, my name is David Kelly. I am chief of the acquisitions branch for the Strategic National Stockpile. Um, I got asked today if I was really David Kelly. Yes, I am. The beard on my face <laughs> is here for just a little longer. Um, many of you have a COVID beard, so you, you understand. But um, yep, so getting right into the agenda. Um, today we'll go through the response history of the SNS. We will talk about COVID-19, obviously. Um, our distributions, the replenishment, and the new procurements that we enacted during COVID response. Then also overview of the federal vaccination campaign we supported. Um, most recently, we started, began responding to monkeypox. So we will discuss that today as well, our initiatives and how we've responded to monkeypox to date. We'll quickly discuss the SNS international support and we'll talk about lessons learned and then forward focus. So here we we're gonna go through the evolution of the SNS capabilities. What you see right here is a timeline of every public health emergency, major public health emergency that we've responded to over the, the, um, since our inception in 1999. Um, you will not see every single response. As you'll see on the next slide, as we go in more detail, we'll take a screenshot, a picture of just from the beginning of COVID to now for you to understand what we truly have responded to. But beginning in 1999, the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile, what is what the SNS was called, and we were appropriated $51 million by Congress. Two years later, September 11th happened. The terrorist attacks prompted federal legislation and directives to strengthen the public health initiatives. In 2003, the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile became what it is today, the Strategic National Stockpile. And with it, we received a substantial increase in mission and funding. Throughout our history, you'll see, uh, especially on this slide, that we've responded to nearly every natural disaster that involved a public health emergency. That includes wildfires, earthquakes, and of course, hurricanes. Uh, one of the most notable responses for hurricanes was Hurricane Katrina. Many of you have seen pictures of the Superdome and the triage centers there. What you saw there was the SNS Federal Medical Stations and Supplies. We supported those, the beds, the cots, everything that you see is the SNS. Fast forward to 2009, you had the H1N1. This was the first major outbreak of influenza in the 21st century. It rattled the world. We were there responding. This was around the same time as well that the SNS received its last the last time the SNS received sufficient funding and direction to procure N95s up until uh, COVID. We fast forward again to 2014, the beginning of Ebola virus. We primarily responded in Puerto Rico. We'll touch on that later. Um, very interesting, uh, unique response to us. Obviously, Puerto Rico is a predominantly Spanish-speaking country, so we had to adapt a lot of what we did into Spanish. We had to work on an island. It was not mainland United States. So our logistics and everything that we implemented to date had to be revised and enhanced. Um, also, sorry, I was actually talking about uh, Zika on that one. So backtrack to 2014 at Ebola. <laughs> yeah, got ahead of myself. Yeah, so backtrack back to, 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 to Ebola. Um, we assisted the response efforts in Africa. Um, it was... I've lost my track. Oh, over in Africa. It was the first deployment of our ABCS, our aerobiological containment system. Many years before that, what we had developed and determined was if there was a need to rapidly transport somebody via air with a contagious disease, how could we do that? So what we developed, research developed, and then bought was an aerobiological containment system that was enclosed in the back of an airplane. It was a G3. And it allowed us to transport up to one patient at a time. So you can imagine we used to have also have G3s that we had to ground it. Um, so we would constantly be flying those back. And because it is a G3, imagine flying back from Africa in an aerobiological containment system and, and going back to the United States. So there were multiple stops, and we coordinated all those uh, alongside CDC. And from what I just talked about with Zika virus, <laughs> sorry, um, in, in 2016, we responded to the Zika virus, which was primarily in, in, in Puerto Rico. And as I mentioned, it was Spanish speaking. That was an evolution of the SNS capabilities. Uh, prior to that, we did not translate or have everything translated into Spanish. We realized right after that point that we needed to, to have dual 
um, language of everything that we had. And then in January 2020, COVID hit us. We began um, responding to COVID on January 30th, 2020, and it has now stretched nearly three years in length. And during that time frame, it's also included other responses, such as unaccompanied children on the border and the monkeypox outbreak this summer. As you may have noticed throughout all of our responses, the SNS's mission and capabilities continue to evolve. This has never been more prevalent than over the past two and a half years. So here is that two and a half year time, time frame that you'll see. And as you can see, we just didn't respond to COVID. We just didn't respond to monkeypox. We responded to a lot of things. So in response to COVID, what did we do? I'll go through a lot of these more in depth in the next slide, so I'll just touch on them very quickly. We began with repatriation efforts over in China and Japan. American citizens were on cruise ships and had to dock, and we had to repatri uh, repatriate them to the United States. We sent supplies and materials overseas uh, to bring them back. We also began re resupplying support for deployed federal responders. We had repatriation sites throughout various states. It's at about the same time that we started our pro rata distribution of PPE. We immediately went into the ventilator deployments, and then we started the support of the federal vaccine campaign. Oh, don't forget, at the end of 2020, we still had hurricane season, and we had two hurricanes that year that we responded to, Hurricane Laura and Delta. Right around January of 2021, the vaccines, um, individuals were beginning to have adverse reactions to vaccines, so we quickly had to procure auto injectors, epinephrine auto injectors and distribute those to all of the vaccination sites to ensure that if there was an adverse reaction, that we could help that individual. Right after we began the EpiPen distribution, and I'll talk about again this later, high flow nasal cannula deployments. So there was a change in procedures for certain population types that recommended high flow nasal cannulas over ventilators. We went out and procured those and made that available. Um, same time, the UC, you see right here, which was code word Artemis, uh, unaccompanied minors, As you can see down here, all the acronyms, JSOC, NIDC, UNGA, POM. So we also respond to every issue in, uh, or every event that's ongoing that involves Congress, the president. So you see the State of the Union address. We are there. We are there prepared in case something goes wrong. We are prepared during the World Series, during the Super Bowl. We are supporting those. In July of 2021, that's when the uh, Afghan, that's when the U.S. military decided to leave Afghanistan. Uh, you had American citizens as well that had to be repatriated, and we supported that. And then again, uh, we had border crisis again with Del Rio that we were supporting, and of course, Hurricane Ida. Fast forward, you don't see on here is monkeypox that we responded to in 2022, but we will touch on the N95 distribution mission. So again, on January 30th, 2020, the SNS Center Operations Center fully activated for COVID-19. This has been the longest and most wide-ranging response in our organizational history. With all the unknowns about the virus and how deadly it may be, everything was urgent and time-sensitive. We partnered with agencies we had never partnered for with before at this level. We partnered with FEMA and nearly every agency and office under HHS. We coordinated with DOD, and DOD assisted us in acquiring product at an unprecedented level and rate that we have never experienced before. We began fully staffing the operations center at a 24-7 um, staffing level. However, once cases began to arise in Georgia, we moved to a completely virtual and remote staffing level. And this entire response, well, 90% of this response has been uh, virtual. So from January 30th to March 13th, the SNS deployed medical supplies needed for response teams involved in repatri repatriating uh, Americans, as I mentioned, from those cruise ships that had to dock over in China and Japan. We also supplied and resupplied medical teams, screening and quarantine evacuees in locations in California, Texas, Hawaii, Nebraska, and Georgia. It was also the same time that the SNS gained operational control of the NDMS, and that is a National Disaster Medical uh, System. The NDMS had over 1,200 caches and caches, kits, and bags with it, and more than 6,000 unique items encompass these. We quickly had to establish contracts for continuous resupply of more than 5,000 unique medical and pharmaceutical items. 
as well as additional freight assets, such as a reverse gooseneck, in order to transport generators, O2 machines, and forklifts. This became the first coordinated response between SNS, the National Disaster Medical System, and the incident management team. So during this time, we also deployed all 100% of our SNS, the FMSs, the Federal Medical Stations. You can see the deployment numbers here on the screen. Typically, when an FMS rolls out, we deploy strike teams. However, given the border or the, the, the shutdowns, the, the quarantines, the stay-at-home orders, that was something that we weren't keen on doing. Also, the majority of those that were supporting the strike team were manning the operations center. So what did we do? We overcome this obstacle through a series of virtual trainings that were held, as well as uh, providing the deployment trainings virtually in both English and Spanish. Remember, we talked about during Zika, we learned about Puerto Rico and even having the need for Spanish. We continue to implement that here. To date, these videos have been viewed over 10,000 times. So while the repatriation mission was also ongoing, we began a pro rata distribution of PPE. We deployed nearly 90% of everything that we had in stock at the time between a, a six week period. The PPE consisted of N95s, gloves, gowns, face shields, goggles, surgical masks. We provided these to the frontline healthcare workers. At the time, 72 million of anything seemed like an awful lot, but little did we know. After this, our warehouses felt empty, and we deployed more than 70,000 pallets of product. The SNS began the response with just over 16,000 ventilators in March 2020. By November, the SNS had 150,000 ventilators in our inventory. Now, there are several issues that come with this. Going from 16,000 to more than 150,000 in six months, what kind of issues could have come up? Well, where are you gonna store that? We, didn't, we don't have excess storage, just like you all. I don't keep, we don't keep excess storage. We don't have 100,000 pallets. We don't have 50,000 pallets of just empty space waiting. That costs us money. We have to be efficient. And we'll get to the money piece here in a little bit. We needed contracts for the biomedical maintenance of these ventilators. You need to sustain these um, as they're used. You need to have them come back and be recertified and cleaned. And third, out of necessity, we procured 15 unique models. And not all of them performed similarly or had the same functions. It made it difficult to keep the messaging and capability straight. So the SNS Operations um, Center worked with our amazing science communications team to create 18 training videos and webinars on all specs for each event, making it easier for jurisdictions to research their exact needs before placing a request. So during responses, there are oftentimes a lot of unknowns. That was the case here. Uh, Things often change, including the recommended ways of treatment for certain population types. Based upon scientific data and discussions with health officials, the SNS procured 30,000 high flow nasal cannulas that could be used on one of our existing ventilator models. We thought this would benefit, they were now dual purpose. We packaged these into kits to send to healthcare providers, and each kit contained five weeks of consumables. We began distributing these in February of 2021. Now, COVID-19 testing supplies. The SNS was provided the mission to support federal agencies, federal employees, and federal responders. So in April of 2020, the SNS procured and began receiving Abbott ID Now test kits. We continue, continue to deploy those as we receive them over the next year. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, is I get a lot of inquiries on, does the SNS stockpile test kits? The answer is yes, but not very many. So the mission of the American population testing, those tests that you've signed up for on that website and the United States Postal Service delivered to you, that was originally run by an HHS work group, the Testing and Diagnostics Work Group. That was comprised of multiple agencies and individuals throughout HHS, including the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, CDC, FDA, ASPR, and SNS. ASPR's newly created or newly established industrial base expansion group assumed responsibility of this mission set at the end of 2021. The SNS is supporting this through subject matter experts and technical matter expertise. We are not the ones procuring this. We are not the ones maintaining and inventorying this product. We don't direct where these go. The SNS does not currently hold a significant volume of test kits in, in our inventory, 
nor are there current plans for us to in the future. There are a couple of reasons for that. Given that many of these tests have a relatively short shelf life, these are very costly to sustain, to rotate. They're also designed for specific pandemic threats, right? So you have a COVID-19 test, it would just test against COVID-19. Again, talking about our industrial base expansion group, what they're working on is they're working on alternatives to this. Is there some kind of warm based where we procure capacity, where we down lines at a, with the manufacturers so that if we need them at a rapid time, we can procure those? Is there another way that we could do this? Is there some you know, technology or research and development ongoing to where one test can test for multiple things? And how do we extend those shelf lives? The IBX team continues to look and explore and work with industry on what that may look like. So personal protective equipment. As part of the response efforts for COVID-19, the SNS was directed to immediately procure what a 90-day supply across the nation would be. These numbers were taken at the worst of the worst during the pandemic, and so they were astronomical to us. We issued contracts for large quantities of PPE, as well as partnered with our agencies over at DOD who procured on our behalf. This was the first time the SNS utilized the Defense Production Act. It's often seen as a last resort. We felt the agency, the administration felt at the time we had no other choice. We also implemented an air bridge to bring raw materials from the United States to where they're manufacturing and bring them back. We also brought a lot of product that was typically manufactured and solely manufactured in Asia and flew it back to the United States to ensure the healthcare providers had it. Additionally, we worked with the Customs and Border Patrol to identify key, uh, key shipments and deliveries so they could expedite the approval process and getting that product into the United States. The SNS will never intend to disrupt the supply chain of the commercial market um, with any of our procurements, unless there is a reason to do such. We want to allow the commercial market to sustain and fix itself, which you often do very quickly. With an increased capability of millions of PP items, we needed to enhance our distribution strategy as well. Enhancing our distribution. Prior to COVID, as Brian had mentioned, the SNS utilized existing 3PL warehousing and transportation vendors. Product was delivered from the SNS to state public warehouses, and then public warehouse, the state and the public warehouses would distribute to localities and the points of care. That is what we have been doing for years. That has been the entire plan. There are advantages and disadvantages to this. Some of the advantages are it's good for localized or intrastate regional events involving a mass profit campaign. So we were not built and designed originally to respond to a nationwide event. If you think about an anthrax attack, that is a localized event. Typically, natural disasters are localized as well. So this is one of the first major nationwide event, aside from H1N1, that we were responding to at this unprecedented level. And to the, the benefit and like of uh, the states, the SNS is responsible for the inventory rotation and management. They don't have a cost in this. It also allows states to manage their resources. So some of the disadvantages to this. We had limited visibility into the last mile dispensing efforts. Once we drop it off at the state, we don't know who it goes to, or we can't ensure there's equitable distribution. It is designed, again, designed to support localized incidents, not nationwide responses. We quickly realized we needed an expanded capability, as many states simply did not have the existing infrastructure and plans in place to support such a vast response. Our new expanded capability needed to have the ability to support large-scale nationwide events or efforts. It needed to have rapid delivery to multiple points of care. And we needed greater visibility into point of care consumption. So we negotiated with industry leaders and contracted for VMI distribution services for more than 275,000 pallets of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. This included different types of storage as well. We had ambient, refrigerated, cold chain, and controlled products. We wanted to leverage the existing distributor capabilities and models, what you all have out there. We did this in a smart way as well. We did partials product storage. We wanted to ensure that the VMI vendors had product and so did we. We could both benefit off each other. Well, you all are designed and deal every day with delivering to points of care. We can ship bulk product like no other. 
And so while we can handle the bulk product shipments, it's industry that we were leaning on heavily to do those points of care, those ones or twos, to thousands of sites a day. Um, distributors, you all have your commercial fleets as you use the FedEx, the UPSs, the, the Crowleys like we do. But you also have, some of you have your own group fleet. So you can uh, mandate that an individual get in a car in the middle of night, in the middle of the truck, and drive it somewhere where it may not be the case or there may be a delay with FedEx coming on site and issues like that. So we see that also as a benefit. And of course, we wanted you to deliver to points of care. However, our VMI models did not include one important concept that we are looking at incorporating in the future, and that's rotation of our product. Um, we also, yep. we know there are several different types of VMI models. Um, the one we implemented here is where we would provide our VMI vendor with the product. They would maintain it for us, and they would distribute it out at a moment's notice. There are other VMI type models that we've implemented. There are certain VMI type models, such as uh, with access to buy. So we pay for a capability for you to reserve, let's say, 50,000 vials of widgets. And then we can exercise an option at any time to buy that at a pre-negotiated price. So we're trying to build up a stockpile to ensure there's rapid capability there but we don't want to waste all of our money at the out front. We'd like to buy down our cost would be in the future. We've done this historically. However, the warm base cost eventually became too significant for certain of our pharmaceutical items that it just did not make business sense. And so we had not done it or replaced it since then. So right here, this is a little infographic. Um, Give you guys a minute to, to focus on this. I want to make a note here that the numbers do not include direct shipments from vendors or manufacturers to locations of need. It also does not include anything that our VMI distributors did for us. In concert with other federal agencies, private sector partners, and state and local health uh, authorities, the SNS has and is continuing to support the national COVID-19 vaccination strategy efforts. The SNS is providing a supporting role in doing this. We are procuring and distributing the PPE and other critical supplies needed for the vaccination campaign. This also includes therapeutic and clinical trials. We've supported point-of-care testing with needed PPE and supplies. We've produced and distributed ancillary and mixing kits to support more than one billion COVID vaccinations. We support the vaccine shipping requirements, such as dry ice. And we procured and deployed auto-injectors of epinephrine to support adverse side effects. So contracts for the ancillary kitting material, kitting services, warehousing, vendor managed inventory, distribution, transportation, dry ice, and various other supplies to handle the dry ice, we rapidly procured those. We had less than 60 days notice of when the a uh, notice from FDA of when the likelihood of the COVID vaccine would be approved and ready for distribution. So we're closely with our partners, our VMI and distribution partners, um, kidding partner, as well as the, the vaccine makers on knowing exactly when that date was. It did flex, so we had to be flexible as well. We immediately established contracts for the procurement of the ancillary kitting material. As you can see the list right there, that is some of the items that go into an ancillary kit. We established a kitting and distribution contract. We had to contract for sufficient kits to meet the vaccine rollout time and demand. We had to build these kits and have them ready in less than 60 days. And we had to establish a process, a process for coordinating shipments of kits to go alongside and reach the same destination point in a relatively short time frame as the vaccine did. There were many challenges during this. There are more than 12 different kit types to meet the different doses in each vial and package. We had to be flexible and adjust production types on the run. There was a desire or a need or an uptick of one vaccine or one certain type of kit that was needed. We had to quickly adjust and start building a different kind of kit. We had to secure more than 2.7 billion alcohol prep pads. At the time, I was thinking, where are we ever going to find 2.7 billion alcohol prep, tad, prep pads in the world? Um, everyone's anticipating vaccinations, so I, we were competing with other federal, uh, other country governments. Other unique things, syringes and needles. As you may know, syringes and needles are inherently of shortage, even more so is what 
type of syringe needle that we needed for this, the LDV, the low dead volume needles. So that was so desired because it could pull that sixth dose out of a vial where there was typically only five. We could extend the critically needed vaccines that were in short supply at that time. The first kits were delivered in December of 2020, and this is one of the largest efforts and greatest successes the SNS has had to date. The public-private partnership between the SNS and McKesson in support of this campaign continues to show how these types of relationships can bring value at the most dire of times. I have another infographic here. I'll let you quickly read through these. Um, we created, or we procured 1.4 billion needles and syringes, 2.7 billion alcohol prep pads, 1.3 billion vaccination cards. 100,000 dry ice kits and delivered just over 69,000 of those. These kits were also something that we developed on the fly. So what we realized and what we were told was the locations that were administrating the vaccine oftentimes may not have the cold chain storage required for the vaccine. So what did we have to do? We had to package dry ice kits, send them alongside our ancillary kits so that they could sustain that vaccine even longer in case they weren't used. And we procured 200,000 epinephrine pins, auto injectors, and we delivered just over 100,000 of those. So as I just mentioned, we procured 200,000 of those epinephrine auto injectors. These were intended to support state rural vaccination campaigns and the potential treatment of allergic reactions. There were adverse side effects going on in a small population. We distributed these for the first time through one of our vendor managed inventories, uh, service providers. They were able to directly deliver these to locations of need. And we realized at that time that the VMI concept is something that could work. So in the early months of 2022, the US was experiencing a wave of increased cases of COVID. This resulted in the decision by the administration at the time to deploy up to 400 million NIOSH approved US made N95 masks to the American public. I want to make note that the N95s that we deployed are only NIOSH approved. They're not NIOSH and FDA approved. Those are the types that healthcare providers, healthcare workers use. The difference between the two is that NIOSH does not have a fluid barrier, while the FDA approved one does in case of splashes. We made the decision to withhold all of the NIOSH and FDA approved back for use with healthcare providers, and that we would provide those just single NIOSH approved to the American public. In doing so, we delivered more than 282 million of these N95 masks through the program. We coordinated with nearly every large and small retail store, federal agency, and others to make sure these were free of charge to the American public. This includes CVS, Walgreens, Kroger, Albertsons, federally qualified health centers, state public health departments, and many others. So the SNS is actively responding to monkeypox outbreak. We activated in May of 2022. In early May of 2022, monkeypox, monkeypox cases started to appear in non-endemic countries. We were put on alert. Thanks to the investments in pandemic preparedness, the United States was prepared. We had vaccines and treatments that can be used against monkeypox. The SNS holds Genios and ACAM 2000 vaccines that can be used to protect people from the monkeypox infections. The SNS has continued to work with our partners across HHS to respond to the monkeypox outbreak. Within five days of the first reported case of monkeypox in the United States, the SNS began distributing vaccines and treatments to the affected states and jurisdictions. So on May 24th and 25th, we shipped out, um, we began supporting the response with shipments to Florida, New York City, and California. And we are continuing deploying our medical countermeasures nationwide to support every state, jurisdiction, metro area, tribe, and locality. To date, the SNS has deployed more than 850,000 vials of Genius vaccine, eight vials of ACAM 2000, and more than 39,000 courses of Tecovirumab. The SNS is working closely with the CDC to ensure vaccines and therapeutics are reaching the people who need them. Equitable distribution. 
again, SNS is equitably allocating and distributing safe and effective vaccines. Genios, nationwide to states and cities based on the case burden and size of the underlying population at the highest risk of severe disease and infection. We've made more than 1.1 million Genios vials available for ordering. As I just mentioned, more than 850,000 of those have been delivered. We are supporting a pilot program to provide additional Genios vaccine to state and local health departments. We are providing ongoing technical assistance and support to jurisdictions planning, or to jurisdictions planning and response efforts. As was the case during COVID, the states were struggling in further distributing these medical countermeasures to the localities, the places of need. We again realized this very quickly. And what we did was we immediately contracted for a commercial pharmaceutical distributor to provide VMI and rapid distribution of Genios and T-Box. This allowed the SNS to expand upon what we originally, the original strategy was for smallpox, which again, we were delivering this to the point that state public health departments, and they were supposed to further distribute it. They did not have that, many did not have that infrastructure built out. What we've established today is we have the capability to deliver to more than 5,000 locations every week. Asper continues to acquire additional Genios vaccine for the SNS, bringing the number of doses available to more than 6.3 million by the middle of 2023. Now, the SNS also holds ample supply of 8CAM2000, and we have made it available to any jurisdiction to order by request. Currently, there is no FDA-approved treatment for monkeypox virus infection. T-pox is an FDA-approved antiviral for treatment of human smallpox disease in adults and children. We've made more than 50,000 patient courses of T-pox available. As we know, this virus also does not know borders. No virus knows borders. That means that this is not just a domestic-only response to a global outbreak. The U.S. government has long supported international efforts to combat monkeypox in endemic countries over the years. This includes Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We provided laboratory training and reagents for diagnostic testing and genetic sequencing. We supported for surveillance and direct technical assistance and outbreaks. And these are just some of the global responses and support we provide. Health security is a global concern, as we just mentioned. The SNS has engaged upon international uh, collaboration over the years. However, we have limited flexibility to provide direct support to an international response. So oftentimes, we must partner with USAID, who we'll enter into an interagency agreement with, and they will essentially transfer us the money and the orders on who we are to deliver this product to for a foreign country. This was the case when we provided remdesivir 125,000 vials of remdesivir to India, and more than $50 million worth of pharmaceuticals to Brazil. Additionally, the SNS has helped numerous other countries by providing lists of manufacturers, vendors, and others that have these products they require, and connecting those individuals with the country's procurement offices and medical, uh, medical officials. So, lessons learned. COVID initiated the largest increase in demand for medical supplies in U.S. history. Beginning in January 2020 and peaking later that year, as mentioned earlier, the SNS was directed to immediately acquire what a 90-day nationwide usage, use, usage was estimated at that time. The difficulty with such is ensuring that we do not further impede or delay product getting to healthcare providers. Yet knowing when the government needs to step in and do everything we can to help the situation as we did with the DPA, the Defense Production Act, as well as the Air Bridge. Some of the challenges we came across, there was no existing mechanism for cross-agency coordination for these types of procurements. There was no platform, there was no mechanism, there was no portal, meetings amongst every agency to understand what, when, who was buying it. We we're often competing with each other, not to mention states, locals, territories, other countries, and you. This was the first time we had a large coordination with DOD for acquisition support to procure large amounts of PPE in such a short period of time. So foreign sources, one of the challenges we had is PPE has historically been produced over in Asia. The majority of manufacturing was there. Alternatives to domestic manufacturing or elsewhere 
were months, if not years away. Fraud was prevalent. Manufacturers were reneging on contracts for high, highest price bidders, and we weren't an exception to that. Countries had or were shutting down their borders. Stay-at-home orders being issued. Employees were becoming sick, which was shutting down plants. You had outbreaks at ports. You could not get a shipping container. There was a significant lack of shipping containers at the time. You had companies like Walmart and Amazon who have a lot of money and were paying the highest prices and buying all these shipping containers out from under everybody. So funding. Funding for certain pandemic products has historically been absent. For example, the N95s. As you heard me mention earlier, H1N1 was the last time we had funding and the directive to procure N95s prior to COVID. Funding at the onset of a disaster often takes time before an agency receives it and we can implement and ex execute orders, execute contracts. Staffing, we were, we've been staffed 24 seven. I think we were staffed 24 seven for just, a, just under two years. People get tired. We got tired, we are tired. Surge, surge staffing efforts were implemented. However, cross training and bringing folks up to speed in the middle of a response is something that's very difficult to do when you are working those 12, 14, 16 hour days. We had to be efficient in issuing contracts. So the SNS developed what is called a class justification at the onset of COVID that allowed us greater flexibility to issue sole source contracts, immediate contracts under urgent compelling or unusual and compelling urgency. Once HHS saw this, they implemented the same thing HHS wide, which assisted every other agency within under HHS, not just the SNS. That was groundbreaking, and we've set precedent for future responses going forward. So, as we move into the future, we want to continue to learn from the challenges and lessons of previous responses and figure out what we can do better. How can we be more efficient? And hopefully, what can we do in advance? We realize the need to build upon established and create new relationships with, with you all, with industry. You are very good at what you do. And you've built out capabilities that simply we can't or, or don't have the funding to do. Um, one of those examples is the VMI type, as I discussed, that allowed us to distribute product at an unprecedented rate. But we hope to build upon this with things like rotation. So the idea behind it is continue to grow. How can we make VMI and distribution better? Is there a rotational component? Can we give it to a VMI vendor and they rotate our product into the commercial market so that we have fresh data product? Right now, Historically, we would say a good product is a product within the SNS that dies on the shelf. That means we never had to deploy it. That is good, but it's also bad. That means we have to buy it again. Is there another way that we can make best use, best value of what we have? Over the past two plus years, we, ha we have built a supply chain control tower that provides visibility into commercial vendors inventory and distributions, which has been extremely informative and helpful in guiding actions that the US government may take in advance or ahead of major issues. We still have legacy COVID pandemic requirements that need to be completed, and we'll discuss those a little later today as well. As I mentioned earlier, the quantities of product we were directed to hold to procure was based upon usage at the height of the pandemic. We are working with the FEMC to revise what the SNS should truly hold for pandemics in a more data-driven, analytical way. And finally, we will engage with the state, territorial, local, and tribal public health leaders to renew historical collaboration around planning, training, and exercising through one-on-one -on -one assistance, in-person and online training, and coordinated exercises for various scenarios. So that's the end of this presentation. If you would like to contact us, we have Brian, myself, and then I encourage everybody to please send everything to the SNS Acquisitions Branch. We will also share with you the SNS Industry Portal, which I'm sure you're aware of. Both of those are managed and monitored by my branch, so you'll get to the right folks, and we will help coordinate and get you the answers that you need. So I thank you for this time, and we'll be doing that. Trisha's going to come up. Thank you. Thank you.